Welcome! The webinar you are about to view presents an elementary particle model for what makes up our world. I am Dr. Delbert Larson, and the work you are about to view was predominantly worked on from the late 1980s through the early 1990s. My work was eventually published in the reviewed journal Physics Essays in 1997, and a copy of that publication appears on this website. In addition to what is covered in the paper, this webinar will add a discussion of the history of mankind's thoughts on what makes up our world. The webinar will also include graphical depictions of composite particles that are a bit easier to follow than what is contained in the earlier published work. First, we will start with an overview of what the goals should be for a theory of what the world is made of. A first goal is that any physical model must have experimental validity in that it must agree with the experimental record. Clearly, if a model predicts one thing, and a nature unambiguously indicates something else, the model must be set aside or improved. Secondly, any good model must be experimentally unique. Often, what is touted to be a new theory is, in the end, simply a renaming of things from an old theory. While it may be interesting, the critical issue is whether a theory predicts something different from its competitors so that a test can be done to see which one best represents nature. A last goal is simplicity. Now nature may not indeed be simple, but science has often advanced by recognizing underlying simplicities. The most famous example is the work of Copernicus and Kepler, who replaced a very complicated system of celestial spheres with a much simpler heliocentric system. But as we shall see, advances in understanding the elemental makeup of the world have also involved moving towards simpler underlying models, and there is some likelihood that if the model is simpler, it may indeed be a better representative of nature than a more complicated model. But an additional advantage of simplicity is that simple models are readily understood without the need to be simultaneously aware of many facets all at once. This then allows for a deeper understanding of nature. Hence, simplicity should be one of the goals for a physical model of our world. Many ancient civilizations agreed on an early elemental system that involved four primary building blocks of nature. As shown here, the ancient elements were considered to be fire, which was hot and dry, earth, which was dry and cold, water, which was cold and wet, and air, which was wet and hot. This early theory of the constituents of the world largely met our goals of a physical theory, in that it agreed with the experimental observations of the time, and it was a very simple worldview for the underlying elements of nature. It was also highly successful in its longevity, as the theory of earth, fire, air, and water was the predominant theory for thousands of years. There were many slight variations on the simple system of earth, fire, air, and water. Variants between the Greek, Hindu, and Buddhist systems involved whether one considered air or wind to be the fourth element, and over time a fifth element was defined as space, or an ether that occupied space. In the Chinese system, air was not considered to be an element, and metal and wood were each considered to be separate elements. The Japanese and Tibetan systems were also similar. Over time, mankind continued to acquire experimental knowledge of our world, and this experimentation led to augmentation of the original fire, earth, air, and water model. The augmentation led to an increasingly complex model, but a model that still stood the test of time for many centuries. In the 8th century, sulfur and mercury were added by the alchemist Gabir to bring the number of perceived elements to seven, and later salt was added as an eighth element. The beginnings of modern chemistry took root in the 1600s with the work of Robert Boyle and his paper, The Skeptical Chemist. Also, Sir Francis Bacon began what became known as the scientific method at about that time. In the 1700s, Antoine Lavoisier 
discovered the law of mass conservation, and he is now known as the father of modern chemistry. Around 1810, John Dalton and Amadeo Avogadro worked toward the development of an atomic theory wherein the elements were believed to be embodied in single small units called atoms. By the 1800s, a great many elemental entities had been identified, and many chemical reactions were known. A major advance in chemistry was the periodic table, developed by Mendeleev and Meyer. Mendeleev used the table to predict the existence of a few new elements, and those elements were discovered over time. But as can be seen from the table, the number of elements had gotten to be quite large. Therefore, the underlying model was no longer simple. At about the same time that Mendeleev organized the complexity of elements into a powerfully descriptive periodic table, work by Hittorf and Goldstein began to investigate the existence of rays emitted by cathodes. Just prior to the beginning of the 20th century, J.J. Thompson and his colleagues Townsend and Wilson identified the cathode rays as being composed of individual particles and estimated their charge and mass. The mass of these particles, which were called electrons, were observed to be over a thousand times less than that of the atom, and this led Thompson to propose that matter was built from atoms that were essentially balls of positive charge with small, negatively charged electrons embedded inside. This atomic model became known as the plum pudding model of the atom. But less than 15 years later, an experiment was performed by Geiger and Marsden under the direction of Ernest Rutherford that showed evidence that there was a small positively charged nucleus at the center of atoms. This planetary model for the atom quickly replaced the older plum pudding model. Shortly after the discovery of the nucleus, Further experiments done by Rutherford showed that hydrogen nuclei could be forced out of heavier atoms in scattering experiments. Hence, a positively charged particle called the proton was identified as a constituent of matter. A series of experiments in the early 1930s discovered yet another type of penetrating substance that was originally thought to be a type of gamma ray. But in 1932, James Chadwick demonstrated that this new radiation was actually a neutral particle with a mass similar to that of the proton, and the new particle was named the neutron. At this point in the history of our world, mankind was once again at a very simple model, as the entire world was thought to be made up of atoms, each of which contained electrons, protons, and neutrons. The model was even simpler than the older fire, earth, air, and water model of the ancients. The electron, proton, and neutron model had much more experimental rigor than the classical theories, and the new model led to a diverse array of elements. Natural science was in a simple, well-organized state of mind, although even at this time it was already become known that there were a few particles in addition to the electron, proton, and neutron. Gamma rays had been discovered in 1900 by Paul Villard, and in 1932 Carl D. Anderson discovered the positron, which is an antimatter equivalent of the electron. But even with these two additional particles, the number of known elementary particles was quite small. Here we see a slide that shows the elementary particles believed to form the basis of all matter as it was understood in the early 1930s. All matter was believed to be built from three particles, the proton, neutron, and electron, although gamma rays and positrons were also known to exist at that time. This model, with five primordial particles, was simple and effective. 